All right, let's open up a blank Igor experiment. I'm using Igor Pro version 8. You should not have very much trouble if you're using 6 or 7. Some things might be a little different, so pay attention, but they're not horribly different. You should be using 64-bit Igor, unless you're on a 32-bit operating system. Uh, I don't know anyone on a 32-bit OS anymore, so chances are you're on a 64-bit OS and you should be running 64-bit Igor. If you're not, find the 64-bit executable in the Igor installation folder and run that one. As you can see, my Igor opens up a data browser and a command prompt as the default windows in a new experiment. Let's go ahead and close those so we can discuss how we open them. To view the data browser, you're going to go to the data menu and click data browser. The hotkey for this is control B, which I highly recommend using. Hotkeys are very useful and make things a lot faster when you're running through analyses. Next, we'll open the command window under Windows, Command Window, or Control J. And that's how we open those windows up. Next, let's open a notebook. So we'll go to Windows, New, Notebook. With some options, we can do a plain text or a rich text formatted, and that includes images notebook. So let's go ahead and do a formatted notebook to make things prettier. And let's write down what we are going to cover. Talk a little bit about the command line. We'll talk a little bit about making waves. And we'll talk a little bit about making figures. So this should give you a very rudimentary understanding of some of the things you can do in Igor. You know what? Let's do one more thing. Let's write a function, because programming is very fun. So the command line, or command window, is a way for the user to interact with Igor. So this is done through commands, operations, functions, uh, etc. For example, let's tell Igor to print the string hello world. So we gave Igor an input of print hello world and it output hello world. You can also do some basic math like square root in the form of sqrt. And we get square root of 5 back. If we wanted more digits, we could use what's called a flag Flags are very important in programming and scripting. So we'll give print the double precision flag so the output has much higher precision. And we get some more digits. Command prompt is your friend because it keeps a history of all the different operations you do in Igor. And if you're doing something through the graphical user interface, Igor will generally print that operation in the command line so in the future, you can program it yourself. So when you're doing a lot of things in Igor, pay attention to the command prompt, and you'll probably learn how to code that way. So that's the basics of the command line. Next, we're going to make and edit some waves. So to make waves from the graphical user interface, you go to the data menu and click Make Waves. I like to proceed my wave names with a W to keep things straight. And we'll name this wave speed in meters per second. I also like to include a little abbreviation of the units in my wave names. Uh, you can have intrinsic units on waves, but I generally don't do this. I just have never gotten in the habit of doing it, but it's probably useful. And we'll make a wave named distance in meters. Let's keep these at one dimension. Like I said before, you can go up to four dimensions. I have never had to go above two, but I suppose if you're doing some crazy stuff, you might need four. I'll make these eight rows. Generally, I always make my waves double float 64-bit. You probably will only, well, generally, 
for most needs, you will only either need a text wave, a double float wave, or a 32-bit wave. The difference between a double float and a single float is the precision of the numbers in that wave. So call back to before when we print out the square root of 5. When we gave the flag D, it printed out the double precision variant of the square root of 5. So that sort of gives you a sense of the difference between a single and double float wave is the precision of the numbers. And the other type, like I said, that you will use is a text wave. Uh, we'll make one of those in a, in a second. But first, let's make a double, let's make these two waves as double float 64-bit and do it. Before we edit those waves, just take a note in the command prompt. Igor has showed us what command it used to generate those waves. So in the future, you can simply type make and give some flags and make your own wave this way. Let's name this wave, let's make this a text wave and labels. So here we just made a wave from the command prompt. I highly suggest making your waves from the command prompt unless you really don't like to type because although this might seem slower, I suppose, um, when you're making like five different waves, it's a lot easier just to type it out. But again, personal preference. So we've made our waves. Let's give them some values. So we'll do this in two ways. We'll do it from the graphical user interface point of view, and then we'll do it from the command prompt point of view. So I'm going to select all of my waves using shift and click. I'm going to hit edit by right-clicking on them and hitting edit. And you can see we've opened up a table which is vaguely reminiscent of an Excel window or something like that. Uh, it's a bit different than Excel, but it's not that complicated. So we have our waves, and they're all initialized with the value of zero, except for our text wave, which is initialized with a blank string. To edit them, simply put some numbers in. So I've put some numbers in the speed wave, and let's put some text labels in our text wave. And then I will put some values into the distance wave using the command prompt. So let's say we wanted to put in the index 0, the first index of the wave, a value of 100. What we would do is write the wave's name using a square bracket, put the index value of where you would like put the index of uh, where you'd like the value to go inside the brackets and type equals the value. So you can see the table auto updated to include our 100 at index 0 of the wave. One thing to note here is that indexing in Igor, like many other programming languages, begins at 0. So what that means is this is an 8 point wave. The way it's indexed is from 0 to 7. So the last index is 7, and the first index is 0. This seems confusing at first to people who are not familiar with programming, but it is very standard, and you will get used to it very quickly. Let's say I don't want to manually put in the rest of these values, and let's say they're also all incrementing by 100 at each step. So it should go 100, 200, 300, and so on. One way to do this from the command line is to edit our wave similarly to before, except do not include a bracket. Simply type the name of the wave and use the, the what's it called? E index value. I forget, I forget what it's called. But basically, 
um, Igor has these these letters uh, P for uh, for rows, Q for columns, and I don't know what for for the other dimensions. But this P basically means at each point, give us the point value. So that seems confusing, but let's just type this example out, and it'll be clear. So we're saying the distance wave set equal to p times 100 at all points. So let's go ahead and do that. And there we go. So at point 0, this wave is 0 times 100, p times 100. At point 2, or point 1 rather, uh, it's simply 100 because point 1 times 100, uh, and so on. So this incrementing index is very useful when generating big waves that have uh, a standard increment or, or something like that. You can even do things like you can get as complicated as you like. So here's our crazy distances from squaring p and multiplying it and whatnot. So become familiar with the uh, indexing variable p and q uh, if you're going to be doing two-dimensional waves. All right, so that's basically how you can make and edit waves uh, very simply. Let's close our table. And when we uh, close our table, it asks us if we would like to save it. So let's not save it. And note the fact that our data still exists. It's not gone anywhere. The table is only a, a way of displaying that data. And when you save a table, you're simply saving a recreation macro to recreate that table. So you're not recreating the data at all. If we wanted to make the same table, we could do exactly what we did before, and there we have it. All right, let's make a figure. <laughs> 